your own measurement and um, to whatever measurements you have and you can specify what neckline you want and what sleeve length and what length, you know, all kinds of things you can specify. And I'm like, if you're doing collars, we should make a clergy collar, get them to do that so we can. Totally. Yeah, cool. And I love custom measurement places because otherwise the shirts never fit me. Yeah. I, I don't know about you, but for me, it completely changed the way that I viewed other clothes. Like instead of saying my body isn't the right shape for this dress, I'm now like that shit, that, that dress is not the right, right shape for my body. Like it completely right. changed. So. Yeah. <laughs> The fabric, not the person. <laughs> <laughs> my body is perfect. Some clothes are not right for my, not good enough for my body. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I love that this is like the queer inclusion one, and we're like, let's talk about our clothing. I like the flowers on your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, with that, I'm going to transition to us to the introduction just because it takes a little bit of time to orient those who are in the Zoom webinar to this space. Uh, welcome to our town halls that prioritize voices of intersectional Lutherans. It's co-sponsored co by Just Lutheran and the Racial and Ethnic Ministry Strategy Discipling Team of the Sierra Pacific Synod. I am Pastor Megan Rohr, and I will be sharing some information about logistics at the beginning of the meeting and collecting Q&A questions from those who are joining us on Zoom. And if you're not joining us on Zoom, you can use hashtag Lutherans Listen, and I'll do my best to check those out too. First, a few logistics. For those who are on Zoom, there is no video and no microphone access. This town hall is being presented in webinar format, which might be different from other Zoom calls you've participated in. Only those presenting will have the ability to turn on video and microphone. Our goal is to center our hearts and minds on the voices we are listening to tonight. This choice is also to decrease the likelihood that this Zoom space will become intentionally disruptive or harmful. Tonight's conversation will begin with moderated questions and then open up to questions from the audience. Because we're in a webinar, there is a separate Q&A section to enter your questions. Please use the Q&A space for questions and in the chat room, uh, which also exists, you can type in any additional wisdom, connect communally or introduce yourself to others. Please do that in the chat room. Uh, if you are someone like me who finds the blinking light of the chat distracting, if you open the chat, slide it to the side of the screen, the light will stop blinking and hopefully you'll be happier. There's a much more complicated way to do it, but this is the easiest uh, to teach you at the beginning of a webinar. The webinar is being recorded and will be available both on Facebook and at justlutheran.com under trainings and curriculum. But you'll also receive an automatic follow-up email if you registered at Zoom with the link to the video if you want to share it to others. You'll also in that email receive a link to an evaluation survey. Um, it will pop up immediately on Zoom. You can fill it out right away or you can wait for it to come in your email tomorrow. Don't worry if you don't have time after the talk though. If you want to review any of these logistics in a second when I stop talking, I'm going to paste it all into the chat room so that you can look at all of this information. But before we begin, I want to acknowledge that sharing your voice in a town hall is a leap of faith, particularly a town hall that is scrambled together because we were supposed to be listening to the Sierra Pacific Synod youth and they were unable to make it and having just a, a, about a day to get your, your thoughts together uh, can be, it can be a squishy thing. So let's treat each other with kindness as we listen. At some point, there might be a technology hiccup or one of my kids might come in and try to seek all my attention. Let's embrace our humanness wherever we find it. We will start today by having folk introduce themselves, their context, and some of the intersections that they embody. Jordan, will you lead us off? Of course. Uh, my name is Jordan Slappy. I use he, him pronouns, and I just finished my first year at Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary in Berkeley. Um, and I'm right now in the middle of field education with Pastor Megan at their church. Um, I am transgender and I'm gay. So those are two big intersections that drive a lot of my work um, and a lot of the motivations I have for being a pastor and being on, or not being a pastor, being on track to be a pastor. So I think that about sums that up. So Asher. 
Uh, thanks, Jordan. I am Asher O'Callaghan. I'm serving as pastor right now of Highlands Lutheran Church, uh, which is in Denver, Colorado. Um, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm transgender as well, and I identify as bisexual. So um, those are a couple of my intersections. Um, I'll invite uh, Lura. Thanks, Asher. Yeah, so my name's Laura Gruen. I am the pastor of Abiding Savior Lutheran Church in Columbia, Maryland. Um, my use she, her pronouns professionally, but if you call me they, them, it will give me gender euphoria and I will be so happy. <laughs> so know that you are welcome to do that too. Um, yeah, I am queer and genderqueer and glad to be here with you all. So uh, Dawn, please introduce yourself. Hi, um, Pastor Don Roginski. I'm senior pastor at United Race Lutheran in Vallejo, California. And um, I'm sorry, my kitty likes to join me on Zoom. Um, I, I identify as uh, agender, which for me, it means I don't identify as either male or female. I use they, them pronouns. Um, but if, if you call me she, I'm, I won't yell at you. Um, and I also identify as queer. So those are, are how I identify. Thanks. I'm, I'm Megan Rohr. Um, I'm the pastor of Grace Lutheran in San Francisco. And I'm also a chaplain for the San Francisco Police Department. And I identify as transgender both male and female, and um, I prefer not to have gender pronouns used if that's something you're able to do. Um, if not, they, them is my second choice. Um, but because I'm a pastor who operates in lots of different spaces, my brain is programmed that I don't typically hear when people are saying he or she. And so um, I don't have a personal preference, but I do find that for folk that gender conversations are hard, practice on me because I won't be frustrated so that when someone in your life is someone who does care very much that you will be ready and prepared to be able to do that for them. My first question that I have for folk is how do the intersections of your identity shape the way that you are Lutheran? Anybody itching to answer that question first? I'm going to lob it to Lura. Okay. Um, Will you also tell people about your background? Because it's really awesome. Oh, yes. So obviously this is green screen. I am not in a rainbow universe, but maybe I am. Um, so a couple years ago, an artist whose name I don't remember made lots of pride flags and gave them out for free online to be used. Um, and they are all created from slices of photos that were taken of space through telescopes. So those sparkles are all stars. And um, many of you might be familiar with the rainbow flag, which is the more traditional down this side. And others may also know that other colors were added to some pride flags. Um, the transgender colors up here and then brown and black to represent um, the racial diversity of our community as well. So that is the background behind me. Um, now I forgot the other question. Oh, my identity is how I'm Lutheran. That's, that's the, the original question? Sort of, sort of. Um, you get to answer any question you wanna answer, by the way. Um, but the question um, was, how do you think the intersections of how you identify shape the way that you are Lutheran? Yeah, so I love the question, even though I didn't remember it. Um, one is that, um, I am a liberationist Lutheran because I have experienced one particular variety of what it looks like to be on the margins. Um, because I experienced some level of discrimination for my queerness, um, it, that has given me just one tiny little peek of what discrimination and marginalization looks like. Um, and I will say sometimes, I usually will say that's how God reached me is by um, the gift of my queerness helped me become interested in anti-oppression work in other ways. Um, my gender queerness makes me really love the Lutheran 
theological idea of both and. We have this idea that we don't need to be either or, we can be both and. And Martin Luther was doing that theologically long before all kinds of postmodernist folks decided to embrace it, including in the queer world. And um, the other is that I grew up in the Lutheran church, such a good girl. I followed all of the rules. Like I won Bible baseball in Sunday school. And like I learned how to read by literally following my mother's finger on the, in the LBW. Um, but there were some ways in which following all of those rules was really paralyzing for me. And my queerness opened up um, all kinds of things for me around the necessity to break certain rules, which also connected to other anti-oppression work, um, that not all of the rules are good and that some of them need to be questioned. I do think there are good rules. I don't, I'm not totally like free for all, do whatever the hell you want to anybody. That's not very Lutheran or Christian to me, but, but to look at the rules and say, which ones of these are bringing life to our community and which ones are not. And as soon as I started doing that, I started experiencing that we have this culture of respectability that um, expects people to behave in certain respectable ways. The church perpetuates that and that is deadly. And so I have gone, um, praise God through Christ who sets me free um, from being a very respectable good girl towards questioning uh, the respectability culture of the Lutheran church, although I'll confess that my own personal life as I live it myself is not as exciting as that makes that sound. So <laughs> I would uh, love to hear Jordan's answer to that question if you're willing to give it. Absolutely. Um, you hit on a lot of why I love being Lutheran and came to the Lutheran church. Um, I kind of bounced around um, a lot of different denominations, um, that trended more towards fundamentalist with my family when I was younger. Um, and so there was a lot about uh, kind of how queerness and religion could never be together. Um, uh, and that one of them was obviously very bad and the other was good and all things religious were good and all things queer were bad. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but that just didn't sit right with me. Uh, for uh, some reason. Uh, later, I realized I was queer, and that's probably why it didn't sit right with me. Um, I mean, also, it's just not a, a great way to think about things or live life. So I really like the Lutheran idea of embracing the both and aspect of creation. Um, and being transgender, I feel like I occupy a lot of in-between spaces in life. And I really appreciate the fact that, um, you know, Martin Luther and Lutheran theology embrace those in-between spaces and the idea that there's not necessarily a clear cut um, right way or, or great way to do things and that we do live within the world and we are called to live and participate critically and justly. Um, and that's something that I can really get behind. Um, and then just I mean, everything we're called to, you know, work for justice for the oppressed. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, being a little bit on the margins with my queer identities has um, really kind of driven home the importance of listening to other folks who are also marginalized in different ways. And I feel like even though we're not always great about executing and we have a lot of work that we need to be doing, um, that the Lutheran Church is a really great place to uh, not start, but to continue those conversations and to move towards uh, this sounds really cheeky and cheesy, but a better tomorrow. <laughs> because today kind of sucks. Um, Don, if you would like to go, I'd love to hear from you. Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I also uh, really love Luther's idea of the both and. In fact, I preach on it um, fairly often. And for me, um, it, it's a lot about in between spaces and it's a lot about um, moving beyond binary thinking, right? That, it, you know, all these binaries that get us in trouble, you know, black, white, good, bad. Um, and in that something can be at the same time, good and bad. Um, if you look at it from different angles, right? And, um, so that has really um, shaped a lot of uh, my whole, my own theology. I mean, I grew up uh, 
Roman Catholic. And when I felt called to ministry, it wasn't possible uh, as a female bodied person. And um, so really exploring uh, different uh, churches and fell in love with the theology of uh, Martin Luther and, and also the idea of the priesthood of all believers, right? That we are all called to uh, worship God, that we are all called to proclaim the good news and that just because I'm ordained doesn't make me any better than anybody else. Um, and, you know, working within uh, the proclaimed community, which is the, the group for um, all the queer pastors in the Lutheran church, um, and being one of the extraordinarily ordained people and having all of those conversations about what does ordination mean and um, how are we allowed to go against the rules of the church and, you know, all these conversations about borrowing authority from the future in the present. And um, it really got me more active more activated than I already was, all those conversations, and because I find found them very life-giving um, and sustaining. And now um, it helps me really be a voice for uh, other people who are marginalized, uh, and hopefully somewhat effectively. <laughs> so Asher, Thanks, Don. I feel like uh, you all pretty much nailed it, so I don't even have to talk. Um, <laughs> but I guess I'll say a couple things that are more specific to like my identity in particular. Um, I also grew up fundamentalist and, um, and have a background in those types of churches. And growing up as, um, as someone who was assigned female at birth, I assumed that ministry couldn't be for me um, and that it was something that I couldn't do and, and, and that I didn't even have a place doing the things that I was already doing, like reading the Bible all the time and asking all sorts of naughty questions and that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and so I think one of the things that really appeals to me about the Lutheran Church is the both and nature um, of us. And, and the, the way that we read scripture, um, which I feel like really respects, um, respects the sacredness of scripture more than fundamentalists because we don't see it literally and because we try to take it as a whole and read it in context. Um, so that's just some of the reasons. But when we really get down to it, um, sexuality is what made me a Lutheran. Um, in spite of everything I may have told my candidacy committee. Um, the reason why I actually stepped into a Lutheran church for the first time was that a girl that I had a crush on invited me. And, um, and I met her in queer theology class. And, <laughs> and so it really is my queerness that um, otherwise I wouldn't even know what Lutheranism is. Um, and then when I went to that church, that was the first time that I felt a place where, where I felt like I was somewhere where my faith and my gender identity and my sexuality could all be at home. Um, and so that's what really inspired me to go and become a pastor so that others can experience similar spaces. And then I'd also say that being white as part of my, as part of my intersections, um, and being a trans guy, I never feel very comfortable with the word man. I just don't feel like that describes me very well, but I can do guy. So um, I, I pass easily, which is a word that means that a lot of people, when they meet me for the first time, they wouldn't guess that I'm trans um, and sometimes are surprised to learn that I'm trans. Um, the fact that I pass and that I'm white has meant that I've had a pretty comfortable experience in the Lutheran church for the most part. Um, and so I'm aware of that and 
want to be able to leverage that privilege um, so that the Lutheran Church can be a more comfortable place for others who don't have that same privilege. Yeah, and, a, and an important message this week in particular, isn't it? Yeah. Um, one of the, the ways in which, for me, Lutheranism gives me permission to translate myself um, to translate the way I present myself into the world is it comes really out of Luther's retranslation of the Bible into different languages. And so my experience in the Lutheran Church is both that of of radical freedom and welcoming, and also that sometimes it's those exact words that other people are translating that sometimes can be what sticks in to our side, like the thorn that Paul felt. And so. Uh, for me, one of the most illuminating things that we've talked about in these town halls amongst really diverse different groups is, is there anything you wish people would stop asking you and research on their own? And I'll lead off with mine. And that's something that happens to me more than once. It's anyone who starts their sentence with, I know I'm not supposed to ask you this, but because whatever they say next usually is gonna make me feel very awkward. Um, a, a question that my wife gets more than I do is, Megan is transgender, but which, which way, which direction? Male to female or female to male? My wife thankfully answers with, Megan is transgender over and over until they stop asking the question. But I've also had people ask me specifically immediately after a sermon of, about the status of my genitals. Um, so mine are mostly body part related. And even if it's for the purpose of praying for me, because I'm going to have a medical thing happen, um, or just out of curiosity, uh, conversations about things that are private, I wish remained private. And I'll send the, the question of things people wish they would stop getting questions about to Dawn. Because you look the most comfortable right now. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I wish that people would stop asking me questions about the way I show up on a particular day. Um, and it's happened a lot around um, synod assembly gatherings or things like that. You know, um, people feeling the need to comment on what I'm wearing. Um, like if I show up with a, wearing a shirt and tie, um, you know, commenting about, oh, you're wearing a tie. And I'm like, yeah, so what? You know, um, or if I wear a dress, then they're like, oh, you're wearing, you know, and it's like, well, I felt like wearing a dress today, you know. And I do that in the summertime because when it's hot out, dresses are cool. So, um, you know, it's, and it's the whole um, binary thinking thing. You know, I've, I've had it happen to me even in a store while, where I'll have little kids. And sometimes little kids seem to me more attuned to things than adults are. But you know, I've had situations where little kids will point at me and say, Mom, is that a boy or a girl? And I really wanted to answer the kid, and then the mom would quickly shuffle the, the, the kid away. And I'm like, wait, what if I wanted to answer that question? <laughs> but, you know, it it's awkward. And um, so I just wish people would make such a stop making such a big deal about what I'm wearing. So I will ask Asher. Um, I would also second what Megan said um, about like asking questions, asking me questions about my body, not, not appropriate. Um, and I would, there was another one that now I'm forgetting. 
oh, this is my most recent pet peeve. With, um, with they, them, their pronouns, when people say, or, or when people have come to me because I use he, him pronouns and therefore assume that I'll be sympathetic to not getting they, them pronouns, will say, but it's not grammatically correct. Because here's the thing, like language changes. Language has always been evolving and changing since the beginning of language. It's just how language works. And so they, them does work grammatically now. And, um, and so just get used to that. And it's just so convenient. Like I was someone who as a kid got corrected by all my teachers because I got really sick of the like one and one self or he or he, she, like, no, just they, it's just easier. Um, and I will invite uh, Jordan. All right, I have two, um, probably my least favorite one is what about babies? Because um, I am assigned female at birth and transitioning to male and people are very concerned with my reproductive status um, and also very concerned as to whether or not I have frozen genetic material. Um, because I guess even though, you know, I'm not opposed to being a dad, why wouldn't I want to be a mom, you know, of a kid that I made myself? Because that's what's important with having kids, I guess. So that one's weird and I don't like all the implications of needing to produce your own biological child to have a connection. So there's a lot to unpack there, don't like it. Um, and then also, am I going to be able to preach to straight people? I get that one a lot. And I don't think that, you know, acknowledging and celebrating um, queer lives and stories and big events means that I'm not celebrating um, like straight or cisgendered events or holidays or mile markers. You know, God forbid a group that has been left out and excluded and had a lot of harm done to them be included in language that includes all people because the LGBTQ plus spectrum represents a lot, a lot of people. So, you know, I don't understand why it has to be one way or the other. So that's a, that's another one. That's a bummer. Um, Laura, would you like to go? Yeah. So um, the biggest one for me is that because I'm fairly femme presenting and assigned female, people are so confused about how I fit in the LGBT community, um, and particularly because my partner is trans mask. Um, and both of us identify as non-binary, but both of us look to the outside eye. People think that, that we're binary. Um, and so I get a lot of questions about like, what is, uh, how, what, I mean, I thought you were a lesbian, like that kind of stuff, um, which has assumptions about gender identity. It has assumptions about sexual orientation. Um, and it also has assumptions about bisexual erasure. You know, I, I, a significant percentage of my queer friends are cisgender people in relationships with someone of an opposite or a different gender than them um, who identify as bisexual, for whom their bisexuality is very important. Um, and so that kind of assumption that it, making all kinds of assumptions about people's gender identity and sexual orientation and being confused that queerness and LGBTQIA plus um, means more than just lesbians and gay men. I would really love for people to learn the fullness and breadth of our community. And not just because I'm tired of talking about or answering questions, but also because we're really pretty amazing and people are missing out when they don't get the fullness and breadth of our community. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't adore that statement more. Um, so assuming that the body of Christ is more visible with the more diversity that we have and the more spectrums we're able to see the colors of. Um, do you have any recommendations for congregations or for synods for the ELCA in how they can minimize bias? And I'll throw, I'm gonna throw it to Jordan. 
Um, the most successful way, or I've been a part of several congregations from little itty bitty new ones to really old um, established big ones with over a thousand members. And I think the most um, successful things I've seen are when folks take it upon themselves to become aware of and educate themselves about their biases. Um, which means looking past, I don't see color or, well, God just wants us to love everybody. Um, you know, God does want us to love everybody. However, there is hard work to be done in loving. Um, and you, to, you know, quote RuPaul, if you can't love yourself, how in the hell are you going to love anybody else? Can I get an amen? Um, it's important to be aware of what you're bringing to the table um, in order to work with other people successfully and in a way that isn't going to, I mean, you're going to do harm and you're going to mess up and that's just part of it. But whenever you are aware of and trying to wrap your head around how to be a better you, um, it's amazing how sympathetic other people can be to that and how um, you can accompany each other on your journeys towards doing that because everyone's got something to work on. Um, but the only person you can control is you. So that's kind of what I've seen work well, um, and that's usually just around conversations. You just have to build relationships with people um, beyond just getting to know someone and then getting to know you. Once you get to know someone, the issue has a face. It's not just a gay problem or something. You know, that's a Jordan problem. Like, that's someone that I love. Um, so kind of going out from there. Uh, and then welcome statements have also been um, really nice. It kind of gets everyone on the same page in the very beginning, this, these are the values of our community. We are about accepting and we are about learning and loving and moving forward with each other with grace whenever we mess up because we're gonna mess up. Um, so those are two things that I would recommend. Oh, and I invite Asher. Um, that was a great start. Let's see, what else? Um, I think uh, the reconciling in Christ process when it's fully engaged by congregations can be helpful. Um, I've found in congregations that I've been at that educational, any sort of educational process is super helpful. I've encountered a lot of folks who want to do the right thing, um, but they just don't know what it is and they don't even know how to ask the questions that they have and they're afraid of saying or doing something wrong and then looking stupid um, or looking like a jerk in some way. And so I think all of these questions depend on like where the particular congregation is and where they're coming from. But if you have people who, who are already have good intentions um, but just don't know how to act on that, I think education is huge. Um, one of the methods that has worked really well in congregations that I've been a part of has been book groups. Um, there's something safe to people, I think, about all, everyone being able to read the same book and then have kind of a basis for conversation. Um, and it can kind of even the playing field too, because they feel like, oh, I've been able to read this thing, so now I know a little bit, and now we can talk about it together. Um, so uh, yeah, that, those are some of the things that I've seen that have been helpful. I also think with regard to trans and, and different gender identities that um, pronoun practices are really helpful to get into the habit of. Um, it's one of, it can be really challenging for congregations to start to do that. Um, but I think that it's really important and it, it certainly says volumes. Um, if you're visiting somewhere and if you notice that people are doing pronoun introductions, um, that makes, can make a huge difference. Um, and I'll invite uh, Don. So I would echo a lot of what um, the previous two have said. Um, education is, is really important. And then um, as a part of that, education a couple of things and to help people first of all say don't make assumptions um don't assume that if i'm presenting um as a female on a certain day that that's how i identify and i i appreciate when people ask um and rather than just assume 
Um, and the other thing um, is a good practice to introduce to people is don't ask somebody else a question that you wouldn't answer yourself. And I think that really cuts down on the really inappropriate questions because they wouldn't want to answer them themselves. Um, so that's what I have to add. So Laura. Yeah, you guys got all the easy pieces. Are I mean, all the you got all the amazing good pieces already. I didn't. You had deep and profound answers to the question, but you had the ones that I was already thinking of. Um, so one thing that I've been thinking about is the way that all of our congregations have a dominant culture, and really all of our institutions that have existed for longer than a minute have a dominant culture. And um, for most of our congregations, that's white. Um, and so there's an element of white dominance that is unwelcoming to people of color, even if um, there are one or two already, or some people are fighting to make a home for themselves there. Um, and that's the same thing in for for many different cultural dominances in our congregations and synods and institutions, including um, heterosexuality as uh, cisgender heterosexuality as a dominant culture. And in many cases, even in our congregations that are reconciling in Christ, there's still a general assumption that everybody acts just like the heterosexual people do. Um, and my personal experience is that that is a significant barrier for many people in the LGBT community, that many of our congregations have a couple people who either aren't super tapped into LGBT culture or are willing to um, assimilate temporarily on Sunday morning to cisgender heterosexual culture. Um, but that we still tend to have a dominant culture of cisgender heterosexuality in our congregations and synods and institutions. Um, so I think that one of, and that that then creates bias, right? Because we'll say, oh no, we, we welcome LGBTQIA plus people. Look, we have that nice lesbian couple over there, right? But then we, but but then someone's else like, but you discriminated against me because of the ways that I'm queer. Um, and, and like, so that dominant culture gets in the way. I'm thinking about um, some delightful members of my congregation in Houston. Um, we were a congregation that was welcoming to LGBTQIA folks. We had many LGBTQIA folks who at least presented as though they were in monogamous lifelong relationships that fit many people's expectations of marriage and um, gender presentation. And then we had a drag queen join us who was uninterested in any of these conventions. And it was beautiful and the congregation accepted him. And it was, um, they were coming to church as their male self, so I'm using him. Um, but we all knew and we were invited to drag shows and, and embrace this person. And all of a sudden, some of the other gay men in the congregation started coming out as drag queens. That had been a thing that they were not free to tell the rest of the congregation before that point. And um, that freedom to me was a gorgeous thing. So one of the things that I think would help to um, eliminate bias is if all of us interrogated and um, partially deconstructed our congregation's dominant culture and probably all of them, but in, for this particular instance, our cisgender heterosexual dominant culture. Those are all wonderful answers. I'm gonna also throw in bathrooms. We want bathrooms that are safe we want to know where they're located. When we ask where the bathroom is, tell us where all the bathrooms are. Um, for everyone, tell everyone where all of the bathrooms are. Um, both trans people and people with disabilities sometimes need single stall bathrooms in order to feel safe. Most people at church would like to not have someone else next to them while they're doing private things in the bathroom. Uh, so, you know, live into that. We are neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female in your bathrooms. Um, I'll just name that because I know that um, medically for trans folk, there is a very high percentage rate of people who get urinary tract infections, who get kidney disease, who get other issues from feeling like they have to not go to the bathroom in public places. You might not know this, but 
I will decide how much liquid to drink throughout my day based on if I think I'm in a place that's safe enough to use the public bathroom. And so for a church to be a safe space for someone to just use the bathroom could be a really wonderful gift, uh, particularly for people who decide how long to stay at coffee hour based on if they think they might need to use the bathroom. So I'm gonna just say that out loud for this group. Uh, one of the questions that we've gotten is what are some of the Bible stories that have fueled you on your journey? And, and I'm gonna add to that, I'm gonna also say fueled you on your journey or um, challenged you on your, on your journey. And I'm gonna start with Laura so that you can't say everyone else stole your answer. <laughs> totally fair. Yeah. I, and I have one ready. So there is a Bible story called The Daughters of Zelophehad, because of course we name female people based on who their father are, is. Let's see if I can. Hogla, Milka, Terza, Noah, and Ho, Holga? I did to get Hogla. Oh dear, that's embarrassing if I don't remember their names. Other panelists can unmute and help me out if you need to here. So these five women, it's in the book of Numbers, I believe Numbers chapter 27. Or is it chapter seven? I'm really bad at quoting. Anyway, my favorite, favorite 27. 27, favorite story in scripture. Um, these five women are not set to inherit land because their father dies without a son. And so they stand up to Moses and all the elders and the assembly of Israel and God, God's self and say, Give us our father's inheritance. Your rule is unjust. And God says to them, to, God says to Moses and to the elders, they're right. In fact, some translations, um, the Septuagint, you all, some of you all know that uses Greek, uses orthos, like orthodox, like they're orthodox for standing up in front of everyone and saying, your rule is unjust, change it. And so the entire law that was given at Sinai is changed because of these five women standing up together to God and saying, give us our father's inheritance, your rule is unjust. That's my favorite story ever, not just in the Bible, ever, in existence. Uh, Asher, tell us yours. Um, I love the stories in the Bible when someone gets a name change. Um, I've really liked those and it, it's been really meaningful for me in having my name changed. Um, so there's those, there's a bunch of them. Um, and then there's also the story of Joseph um, and the coat of many colors. Um, the word used for coat is also elsewhere translated as dress. Um, and so you can read the story of Joseph as, as a story of, of bullying and of um, an assault and violence against someone who is genderqueer. Um, and, and that being one of the things that made him special to his father. Um, so that's another story that I like. Uh, I'll invite Don. Um, it, you know, one of the stories I've been thinking a lot about, you know, because Sunday is Pentecost and I've been thinking about the Holy Spirit and how the Spirit shows up throughout scripture. And I think about uh, the Valley of the Dry Bones, right? And that how the very breath of God brought life to things that, that were not living and how powerful that is that there was no uh discriminating against oh well only these bag of bones get the breath and these it was like universal and um how that very breath comes to us and um and as far as sustaining for uh my journey i i go to psalm 139 a lot um and that's the psalm where the psalmist talks about god creating us in our mother's womb and that i i've searched you and know you and that um and then it comforts me to know that god knows me completely and loves me just the way i am um 
And so when times get tough, I go back and read that again. Um, so I invite Jordan. Um, I also like the one about being fearfully and wonderfully made and then together just as you are. Um, Cause I spent a lot of time being relatively mad about my circumstances and <laughs> not being able to run away from the fact that I was trans. Um, you know, I just thought it would be easier. So it's nice to know that that wasn't an accident and I'm still loved and um, beautiful just the way that I was created. Um, and kind of in that same vein, I you know this one gets used a lot for a lot of different things, but I'm a particular fan of the body of Christ um, metaphor that is drawn. Um, it has helped me come to terms with kind of a lot. I don't like body things usually um, because I don't like my body. And it's only been very recently that I've been able to come to see my body as something that is good or beautiful in any capacity. Um, so thinking about that and how the members need each other and it doesn't do any good for the members to quarrel amongst each other has not only helped me love my own body and appreciate the functions that it has, even if I'm not appreciative of them all the time. Um, and it's also helped me to learn to love people who don't necessarily um, agree with me or who I am or my lifestyle to use that language. Um, you know, I don't want to be in a body with them either, but here we are and they <laughs> contribute something and they were also uh, created for a purpose and are loved as well. So I think those are my two big ones. That's really wonderful. I've been really enjoying all of the post-resurrection stories of Jesus lately. There's something really beautiful about Jesus's body changing so much that people don't recognize it. And that process of them recognizing that Jesus's essence, whatever that means, is still there. Maybe it's that they recognize the act of communion is proof where Jesus is, right? But I think there is something about what happens on the mountain at Transfiguration and this post-resurrection body of Jesus, that process of rediscovering that the person you love is still there, even if you don't recognize them, it's not the same as the trans journey, but it has some of the components, I think, for people who, who want to still love the trans people but are trying to work it out. So it, for me, it feels like a, a good P flag kind of Bible verse. It's parents, family, and friends of lesbians and gays. And there's always this process where parents are trying to love their kids no matter what, but maybe don't have the language for it yet. And I see these like post-resurrection encounters with Jesus as very similar to that journey of like, I want to love you. Where did you go? I'm figuring this out. And the awkwardness of the disciples is they're trying to figure out how to like get their communication kind of pre-Pentecost and, and figure it out. So there's something I kind of uh, enjoy about the awkwardness of those stories. It, it for me reminds me of one of the questions that I get a lot from people on social media, which is, um, how can I let my kids know that I love them? They're trans and I love them. Or how can I let them know that God still loves them? It's this, this assumption that folk have that they're maybe not going to be cared for by their communities and their families. And so I get a lot of messages from people who are just really eager to demonstrate publicly that their love for their child still remains. And I wonder if I'm assuming several of you have maybe gotten some of those questions before by the kind of nods of your head, but when you get a question from someone about how they can demonstrate love to their gender diverse loved one, what kind of advice do you normally give them? And I'm gonna send it to Asher. Um. I think listening is, is huge. Um, and I think it doesn't hurt to say that too. Um, so like if, if you're feeling like you really love this person or, or your child and you don't know how to support them, but you want to make sure that they know that you love them, like just say that. Ask what kind of support do you need from me right now? And trust the answer that they give you. Um, I feel like the times when 
I think about when I came out to my parents and um, they listened to me. We had had a number of difficult conversations before I came out to them because they had noticed I had done things like shave my head and that made them really uncomfortable. <laughs> and, um, and they had expressed that and it had been hurtful to me. And, um, but when I actually came out to them, they could tell that it was important enough to me that they just listened. Um, and in particular with coming out conversations, if you can like hold back on the questions, that can be really helpful. Like there'll be time to ask the questions later, but when someone's first coming out and when they're trying to figure things out and figure out how to tell you and how to live into that part of the relationship, holding back on some of the questions can be really helpful at first. Um, that's all I've got on that. Um, I'll invite Don. Wow, well, I don't know if there's a lot to add to that. Um, <clears throat> I, I would add that um, I think it'd be helpful for parents to educate themselves um, as well um, so that they're not just expecting their child to teach them everything there is. Um, and, and then, you know, maybe they might want to talk to other parents and, and so that they can feel support of other people. Um, and there are organizations out there like Gender Spectrum and others that help parents do that. Um, Laura. Thanks, um, you all had great answers. Um, one that I would add would be um, to defend the person that you love from attacks and to speak up. Um, even if you're not sure what the right words are, you can still say stop. You can't say that. Um, and that that makes me feel loved when people around me do that. Um, the other thing I would say is that to trust that you already know how to love your child or your loved one. And um, maybe if there's a way to show love that's super gendered, like, um, I, I used to take my child out to go get pedicures. I wonder if they would still like that. It's okay to ask, but in general, you already know how to love your child. So keep doing those things. Go ahead, Jordan, I just cried. <laughs> your turn. Thanks. Um, yeah, I second the just tell them that you love them. Um, you know, that's really important to hear. Um, and that's a pretty easy one, but also not as easy. Um, you have to let folks go at their own pace and kind of do things as they will. You are a part of the journey, but the journey is not about you. So that's important to remember. And kind of in that same vein, it's really okay to grieve whenever your kid comes out as queer because you spend all of your life building up these hopes and dreams for them and you maybe didn't necessarily entertain the idea that your kid would be trans or that your kid would marry someone of the same gender identity. Um, but again, like it's, it's okay to grieve and it's okay to feel your feelings and I encourage you to do that, but it might not always be helpful for you to bring the person who just came out to you into that. Um, it's not your journey, it's theirs. Um, and you do get to feel, but you know, you need to support that person and love them and kind of deal with that on your own. And if there's a space to talk about it, that's healthy and helpful and not going to make this person who is still the same person they've always been, um, feel as if it's, it's as if they need to comfort you whenever they're probably going through a whole lot themselves. Well, you're, you're on a roll, Jordan, so I'm gonna throw it back to you. Are there books? that you um, find helpful or that you would recommend to others? Absolutely. Um, I actually grabbed this off my bookshelf before we started. Um, it's called Transforming the Bible and Lives of Transgender Christians by Austin Hartke. Um, he is also transgender and I think the best people to learn about um, things from uh, concerning that community are people from within the community. Um, he is very gentle and generous in the way that he breaks down um, 
trans issues and terminology and incorporates Bible stories and questions. And then in the end, there's even um, a section called the Trans Affirming Toolkit or Toolbox to something that effect. But, you know, it's a, it's a really good guide for anyone. If you know a lot about trans issues already, then it's really refreshing to see them all laid out so beautifully. And I also learned a few things. Um, but if you don't know anything, it's also a really great place to start and it's accessible um, to people who are maybe as receptive to the idea because it is written from a religious place. Um, so that's probably my biggest recommendation. But YouTube is also a wonderful resource um, for learning about that. There are plenty of people from all over the spectrum um, that have videos about what it's like and what they like and they don't like. and you know, again, who better to hear it from than someone who's directly impacted, so. Oh. Invitation, here we go. Okay, uh, Laura, would you like to go? Um, sure, although it's a hard question for me because I like to match the recommendation to the person and why they're asking. Um, so, uh, a new book out is One Coin Found by Emmy Kegler. I like that one to give to um, LGBTQIA plus people who are just beginning to reconcile faith and spirituality. Um, all my friends are writing books right now, so that makes things complicated. Uh, to um, Broken Bread, uh, is that the name of Emily Scott's one? I'm not sure I got the title exactly right, but Emily Scott has a book coming out right now um, that touches on queerness while talking about the church in amazing ways. Um, Lenny Duncan's Dear Church includes a chapter on queerness. Um, uh, that Dear Church, um, a love letter from a black preacher to the whitest denomination in the US has a lot of stuff in it. Um, if I'm trying to sneak material into an audience that might not be 100% prepared for it and I want to lead gently, um, Rosella Haiti White's book, Love Big, is a really amazing and powerful one that's very hard for anyone to argue with. It, it, it's a good one for gently challenging people to love more because it's really hard to be angry. At. Um, so those are some some that I have been recommending frequently. Asher. What they all said. Um, and the one that I would add that I would say is particularly good for evangelical audiences, if you have people in your life who you love who come from more from more of an evangelical standpoint, is Walking the Bridgeless Canyon by Kathy Pullbuck. Um, it's very exhaustive in terms of it's, it's long and it goes into a lot of detail, but I think it covers, it covers how to read the Bible differently and the history behind how we came to understand queer identities in some really helpful ways. Uh, and Don. Um, that's a pretty exhaustive list. Um, I was just going to add that there's some interesting TED Talks um, from an organization called Born This Way. Um, and I'm blanking on the, the person who does the talks. And I hate it when that happens. But anyways, uh, if, you, if you looked at Born This Way, you could find them. And I have, I have a weird story to tell about books, if you'll indulge me for a minute. Um, I failed systematic theology in, in seminary um, because the professor believed you had to first tell people verbally how sinful they were before you could be their pastor. And, the, and at the time I was working with the chronically homeless. So it was very clear to me I wasn't gonna pass this class. And so what I did is what queer people sometimes do is I was, I wrote like, the most academically researched systematic theology paper I could, because if I was going to fail, I was going to fail good, right? And I wrote all about liberation feminists and, and queer theology, and it was this wonderful thing that I worked on because I was angry. So I failed the class. I retook it from C.S. Song, who was the president of the World Council of Churches. He read the same essay I had turned in. He said, you're going to get an A. Let's just chat. And it was like the best semester of my life. And, but I took that kind of 
frustration I had from that systematic theology class, and I just kept writing queer theology. And I ended up publishing it in a book called Queerly Lutheran, which when I go back and try to read it, I'm surprised that I wrote those things back when I was in seminary. It was, it was published pre-2009 policy change, so a lot of it doesn't apply. Um, but in the back, I researched like over 300 names for sacred trans people throughout the world prior to colonization. Like I like went big on my like academic research. And I put, it was like back, right when you could just start like publishing your own stuff but it wasn't cool and it meant you like weren't a real book author, right? So I put it out in the world and kind of forgot about it. Every once in a while someone would be like, I read that, that's interesting, thank you. And then I would be very embarrassed. Um, so then the 500th anniversary of the Reformation comes along and I get, a, I get an email from Wittenberg, Germany that they want to take this book I had written and put it in an exhibit. Um, featuring 95 different people who had taken the works of Martin Luther to like an important historical place. And the other Americans they picked were like Dr. Seuss and MLK. Right? So I'm not going to say they have bad judgment for picking me, but it was beyond an honor. Okay. So they took this book and they put it in an exhibit across the street from Martin Luther's house. And then they took a video Bible study I had done about trans people and the Bible and they put it up. And crazy, right? See, people are now posting that they love the book. So, you know, yay for that book existing. But it was born out of being pissed off, right? It was born out of being told that my theology was wrong and I did get an F for it. I do kind of feel like I won, right? If you're going to get an F in systematic theology, you have the people in Wittenberg put it in the exhibit. But uh, my question for you all is, what's, what's an example of a time when you got really pissed off or you were really wounded, but you were able to take that moment and maybe uh, heighten your ministry or become something better than maybe you would have had the drive to do because you were fueled by angry uh, by anger because I think right now there's a lot of anger there's a lot of grief and stories about how we took anger and grief and channeled it into beloved community or whatever re we recycled it into could be really helpful to share right now Don do you have a story about that um well, the, the one that came to my mind right away was um, in, in my current call. Um, so typically, you don't know who votes for you and who doesn't when, when you know, you're, they're voting on your call. Um, but I had somebody actually come up to me and say, you know, I voted no on calling you because I don't think that you should be preaching the gospel. And so this person is a well-beloved person in the congregation and I knew that I was gonna have to deal with them um, on a regular basis. And so even though I was really angry at the time, you know, I, I thought, about what to do and I actually gave the person some resources, uh, a book to read and um, said, you know, can I invite you to read this and then we'll talk about it. And um, so we had some conversations about the book and the book is um, called God versus Gay. I don't know if you're familiar with that book um in i had conversations and um what i was told is that in the book there was a um a clear delineation about how god changed their mind right and so then the person said well if god can change his mind, the pronoun, 
they use. I can too. And, um, and now I get hugs on a regular basis from this person and we're good friends. Um, but it was a struggle to get there. So I think sometimes um, as hard as it was for me to put aside that anger, to be a little patient, um, because I, I know that I didn't fully come to myself in an instant, so. Um, I will invite Asher. Um, I'm having trouble thinking of one particular story, but um, I think I do my best writing when I'm angry. <laughs> um, I got around the time that I was um, about to come out um, and try, kind of figuring out myself that I was transgender, um, I got really into slam poetry. And I think the thing that I loved about it was, and there were a bunch, there's a bunch of queer slam poets that helped. Um, but I love that it gave voice to the things that I was feeling that I couldn't quite put words to. Um, and in experiencing other people tapping into my anger and my own like deep feelings, um, I feel like it set me free. It kind of like unleashed me um, and gave me permission to do the same. Um, and I feel like that's really how I found my voice was through a lot of anger that slam poetry tapped into. Uh, Jordan. Um, so I similarly can't really think of one thing in particular. I think it's kind of a culmination of a lot of experiences and just unfortunate rude questions and slurs. Um, and, you know, asking to could you just tone it down just a little bit or, you know, we get it, but could you not tell people we don't want to make them uncomfortable? <laughs> like, okay. Um, but because I've been told all those things and had those experiences, um, I can tell people that I've been there too. And I know what it feels like. And it's given me the um, gift of being able to just sit with those people and be mad or be sad. Um, I don't have rose colored glasses regarding the church. Um, so I think that just admitting that sometimes things suck um, and there's not really a great way to make them better. Or, you know, you can't undo all those nasty things that were said to you or that you've heard. And I can't blame you for feeling the way that you feel. You know, there's no amount of me telling you that Jesus loves you. <laughs> that's going to make you change your mind or think it's a good idea to go back. And you're, that's honestly like a, a safe decision on your part. Uh, if you don't go back to that place, then they probably won't hurt you again. Um, but, you know, I've been able to, through those um, conversations and just kind of accompanying people when they're low or feeling what they need to feel or if they need to be angry at someone, you can be angry at me, I can take it. <laughs> um, and so I've been able to have just kind of conversations that helped people move from a place of just being really angry and furious um, to a place where they can uh, articulate how they felt and have conversations and go back and talk to folks and kind of start to heal, I guess if that's, I don't know if that's the best word, but they can start to process what happened to them in that trauma and move into a healthier space for themselves, um, be that inside of or outside of the church. So. And then uh, Laura, if you'd like to go. Yeah, I couldn't think of a particular example either, um, but a lot of my ministry is fueled by anger um, and it's fueled by anger that comes from loving people. It comes from anger that's fueled by being people's pastors and hearing their stories and being angry with them that the world has done this to them. Um, and so for me, that tends to mostly come out online, which means that um, my bishop says, you're way more pastoral than people think you are online, because I do a lot of yelling about the ways the church has fallen short. Um, and it's interesting. 
I shouldn't say this. I love my bishop. I have the best bishop in the entire ELCA. I am not telling stories against him. But sometimes he says to me, Laura, you're really scaring people. And I say, oh, oh no, I'm scaring the white men, right? People means white men. Um, because what I've discovered is that being able to express my anger that the world is not a good place and the church is not a just place and um, even about specific things makes me safer for other marginalized people and they will trust me to be their pastor and they or um, other clergy who have other marginalized identities will tell me they feel safer in a room because I'm in the room with them and they know that I'm going to say something if there's a microaggression which I'm not sure I always live up to but I love that people hope that for me um, and so that's yeah so anger really does help my ministry in that way did everyone talk that time or we still have um okay you did great and if you're not following Laura on twitter you should because that's where the real good fiery stuff comes out that you i almost always am like yes i agree with that but then i always am like but am i bold enough to push like that's the that's what Laura will have you ethically checking within yourself right um, so I'm going to read this next question because it comes with a comment as well, but I think it's a good one. Uh, with all the events that have happened over the past week or so around racism, I have had to confront a white supremacy voice that is still in my head in these moments. I am white and recognize that my white supremacy is, is the culture in which all of us live and move and absorb and that it doesn't make me a bad person to know that I still have to combat this within myself. I wonder if each of you still have to resist binary voices in your own heads at some time. Despite the frustrations you feel, when are you confronted with that behavior toward you or towards yourself? Um, and I will throw this to Jordan. So I do have to deal with those things um, surrounding race and gender and sexuality. Um, I, first I'll say, kind of whenever I think about something like that, um, I've always heard that your first thought is what you're socialized to think. And then your next thought or your reaction to that thought or what you actually do is um, the person that you're trying to be and projecting out into the world in spite of your socialization. Um, and it's really, really, really hard to undo something that you've heard over and over and over again, especially from people that you love. Um, so, you know, it, but the, the fact that you're aware and willing to look at that and think critically about it, I think shows that you're on the right track. Um, I don't know you, but, you know, that sounds pretty decent. Um, and then I confront that in myself just Whenever I first realized I was trans, I really hard corrected super masculine um, because I thought that that's what you had to be in order to be a boy. Um, and I don't think that, and I have never been friends with overtly masculine men. So, and my dad isn't really masculine. I mean, I've never really had that role model. Not that he's not masculine, but just he's very in touch with his masculinity and comfortable with himself in that respect. So. I don't know why I did that, but that was just, well, it was what I was taught and that's what I saw. And those were the kids I went to high school with that didn't get picked on and bullied and beaten up. So of course, if I'm going to be like that, I have to model and mirror that. Um, and so I realized that, that was internalized homophobia um, on my part. And I had to learn to balance my, who I was um, with who I wanted to put out into the world, um, which is kind of different for people, but that's where, I think that's one of the biggest times that I ever confronted and was kind of like, ooh, you know, I'm really hard on myself sometimes. So yeah, that's how that comes out. Um, and then Don, would you like to share? Um, you know, I, from a young kid, I knew that um, my gender was different from other kids, and, and I would try things on, like from being super feminine to being very um, masculine, and it never seemed to quite work. And um, 
So, you know, I, I was often hard on myself and, you know, thinking, well, I got to figure this out. Um, and then, you know, as I grew older, um, realizing, well, um, actually, I, I don't need to figure it out. And I have been told um, by a number of people that, oh, you can't identify as a gender, you need to pick one. And um, at first I would be really hurt by that, but now I, I am able to say, well, actually, no, I don't. Um, and so I'm just going to present how I feel like presenting on a certain day. And, um, and sometimes it's important for me to, to, to challenge people's binary thinking. Um, when people talk about gender as a spectrum, and then there was a lecture I went to, where, and I went up to the, the person saying, you know, um, a spectrum is actually binary. And it like blew his mind, like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, it's def defined by two ends. That's binary. So, you know, I, I do try to help educate people too um, about that. And then it makes me feel better as well. <laughs> so, um, Laura. Yeah, I absolutely struggle with all those things all the time around race, around gender. Um, I don't know if you all caught me. I already messed up in this past hour when I was talking about bisexuality. I defaulted to saying opposite gender, which I don't believe genders have opposites. And then I corrected myself and said, I mean a different gender. Um, so yeah, all the time. And as a um, femme person who is partnered with a mask person, I catch myself defaulting to heteronormativity, like, oh, I need to look sexy to attract my partner. And clearly that means I need to shave my legs. And my partner's like, A, it's not your job to look pretty for me. And B, who told you I even like shaved legs better? You know? Um, so yeah, that like that stuff's real. But I think it's also important to remember that it's part of white supremacy. It's part of the way that we conceive of masculinity um, and a world in which masculinity is, prived to, um, is prized. That there's a lot of lies that are told to us. And one of those is we have to be perfect. Um, and that's a lie from the devil. And it is not Christian. The Christian life is about living an entire life of repentance and um, reconciliation reparations there if they need to be, um, and transformation. Uh, transformation has the word trans in it, so that's super fun. Uh, we have Bible verses like, be renewed by the transformation of your mind. Um, that's part of Christian life, and that's part of what we can expect our work to be. And sometimes that's daunting and overwhelming, but when I mess up, I turn it into affirming, like, oh, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to realize I mess up. I'm supposed to feel like I don't want to make that mistake again. I'm supposed to ask for help to do that better next time. That's what a huge part of being a Christian is to me. So um, yeah, that's, that's all of us. And uh, there's grace for that. So we all keep working on it. Um, did everyone, now I lost track of everyone speaking again. Megan, I don't know if you've answered this one. Do you want to? You don't have to. Yeah, I can answer. Um, I think, yes, absolutely. I think everything from, I tend, I'm a, I like to study things and I like to research things and I like history. And so as a professional overthinker who is paid to ponder, I definitely overthink things that are dumb a lot. Um, like um, what outfit I'm wearing and why. What does it mean that I'm wearing a particular outfit? Um, haircuts. For me, like I've had this haircut for maybe 20 years because I don't like people to touch my ears and I've always cut my own hair. But then as, as white supremacy, um, started being hipper, isn't that gross? 
they started getting similar haircuts as me. And then I had to overthink like, is my haircut going to confuse me as like with a group of people who carry an ideology that I will work my whole life to be against? Um, I, I probably before I go to public events, overthink answers to questions that would embarrass me. Like I try to come up with the answer in advance before going to public events so that I am a little less transparently embarrassed in front of other people. Um, and I think that there is a voice in my head. Here's something that I learned. I, I was invited to Norway to speak at the St. Olaf Festival. And my question that I was supposed to answer in front of the Bishop of Norway, who had to respond to my answer, was, um, can the church ever make up for the damage it's done because of its conversations about the body? Which is a great little like softball lob to being able to say whatever I want. And they invited me because I was trans. And after the event, uh, which was on like national Norwegian news, uh, there was a story about it in the national Norwegian paper where they, mislabeled me, not my gender, but my title in the church. They called me a bishop. Yeah, scary for anyone who, uh, for that, for that, for whom that call would be beyond uh, what they think is fun. Um, but because they did that, I had to really check myself because I didn't think a trans person could be a bishop. And so the typo felt like it was reflecting on me, like I was bragging or something, or I like that I had done something to encourage this like misprint about myself. And I felt differently about that typo than I did. Like I get, there was one week in the San Francisco LGBT paper where they called me a trans woman. And two days later, they published an article calling me a trans man. And I didn't correct either story because I don't correct things like that. Um, but it bothered me more that they had called me bishop in an undeserved way than when I had been misgendered. And so I, I did a lot of thinking about that. Like, why was it that I felt like a trans person could, like, why couldn't a trans person be a bishop? And then I started thinking about it the exact opposite way. Um, just being appreciative for that typo, because it meant everyone in Norway who reads the paper thinks it's already happened. The thing that I thought was impossible that a trans person would be a bishop, the people in Norway are like, yeah, there's the trans bishop right there, right? And so for me, even if I'm like never elected to that position, which I still have a hard time imagining that it would happen, um, there, there is still something within me, whatever it was that kind of had that guttural reaction of like, no, you can't make a typo in that way because it's not a thing. I, I've done a lot of work over the last um, year and a half since that happened to be like reclaiming my sacredness. And part of that journey was that I intentionally went to the house of my ancestor, my, my 16th great grandfather. So if you say the word great 16 times, my 16th great grandfather is the patron saint of Switzerland, which is kind of cool. I have his picture right here. So this is uh, Bruder Klaus. Uh, and he um, is known for being the person who like ended civil wars and promoted nonviolence. That's why Switzerland doesn't fight anymore. So you're welcome, everyone. Um, <laughs> but I, but so they have a house for him and then they have like several uh, churches built in the place where he had a hermitage. And it's so popular to go visit his shrines that they have more than one church like, cause it gets so full, they have to have simultaneous services. And so I took this pilgrimage to my ancestors space and he was a saint in the 1400s. I think Luther quotes him a couple times or at least that's what Guy Irwin told me. Um, and he lived during a time where he wanted to be a hermit. He wanted no one to talk to him. And as an introvert, I identify with that. But the Pope at the time declared him as an indulgent. Meaning if you touched Bruder Klaus, you were guaranteed forgiveness from all of your sins for the rest of your life. 
So I imagine him being like one of the earliest Pokemon Go where people are like, and in his cell, it's like built so he can watch church without anyone touching him, right? And I just was thinking about like what it would be like to think of yourself as such a saint that, that you had to like hide so people wouldn't think that that's how, by the way, God loves you no matter what, you don't have to like touch people. Um, but so I've been trying to like, I've noticed that in my life, I've had so much pushback saying why people think I'm sinful that I've never given equal amount of time to thinking that I'm a saint. And theologically, I know we're all sinners and saints. But so what I've been trying to do is give myself intentional time where I tell weird stories that people can't relate to about Wittenberg, Germany, like to not apologize for success and to try to um, not let my lack of imagination prevent other people from imagining me in roles that I think aren't possible yet in our church. And so I think that's a place where, where I'm at um, in thinking about that. Did anyone else not get to answer the question who wants to admit it? No? Okay. Asher? I don't think I did, but I okay. think that all of you have said good things. And I'm not sure I have anything to add to it other than, yes, I struggle with those things. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, so here's, here's what I would, would ask you all is, what is a way that you have um, celebrated your own uh, gender diversity? kind of in the same way that I've kind of decided, like, I just need to celebrate this and lean into it to try to balance it out. Are there things that you want to share publicly in a recorded conversation about how you have celebrated or rituals, ways that you've lifted up the positive, um, particularly in light of how so much of our lives can be about questions and weirdness and, and stuff like that. And I'll, I'll throw it to Lura because you're nodding the most effusively right now. I'm glad I won't do that anymore. Um, but no, so I um, am the only femme person, I think, or the only person who's claimed femme on this so far. So I'm really leaning into that right now. But that was a hard identity for me to claim for myself, um, in part because I was raised by a really feminist mom who was very second wave feminist um, and enjoyed the freedom of not needing to wear makeup or not needing to look femme or not needing to wear dresses. And she doesn't like any of that. So for her, um, the feminism of the late 60s and early 70s was completely freeing and, um, and as regards to gender expression. And she taught me that um, makeup is inherently patriarchal and that um, dresses and performing femininity was an inherently patriarchal. And so it became really hard for me to, to claim that as something that I celebrated, um, even though she, uh, she tells me that I have been that way for my entire life, that the only way she could get me to wear blue jeans was to sew lace onto blue jeans when I was a four-year-old. So, um, and like my parents bought this like property in the woods. We were like hauling firewood and gardening and I would have been helping with this when I was four. And mom said I was perfectly content to go play in the dirt. I just wanted a frilly dress on to do it. And she had to be like, that's not going to work. So I'm going to sew lace on your blue jeans. So at least that way I can put them in the wash. So it's been really hard for me to claim. Um, one of the things that helped me claim it was getting to know trans women because it was really clear, and particularly trans women who are femme, because of course not all trans women are femme, um, and it was really clear that whatever they were doing with uh, putting on makeup and expressing their femininity, it wasn't to please the patriarchy, right? Like they're undermining the patriarchy in some way, and so, and they have a genuine and authentic femme um, gender expression. And if it's genuine and authentic for them, then maybe it can be for me too. And the other thing was, um, the more I connect with being genderqueer internally, the more comfortable I am expressing femme, which who knows what that is, what that's about. Um, but so uh, actually the fact that I have on red lipstick right now, I don't always. Um, a lot of people think that's a little bit much for church, but when I'm in queer spaces where I'm like, 
this is my feminist deal with like that's how I express it um so yeah that's every time um and it can be um battle paint for protests or it can be um party makeup and it can be a lot of different things but literally putting on red lipstick is one of my ways of ironically expressing gender queerness but but the identity of of who i am as as a child of god um asher do you have one sure um i like this clergy shirt that i'm wearing um <laughs> embracing things like like clothing and i don't always i don't really identify strongly as mask or them um because it just depends on what kind of mood i'm in um but i really enjoy getting to do things like pick out an outfit for the day that like expresses how i'm feeling um i'm also a four on the enneagram so it's like i have very much like like to express my mood through my surroundings um and uh yeah so i think clothing is one of the ways that i do that i also really love this isn't a way that i do it necessarily but i love drag um like drag just it gives me life to watch um to watch it um so those are some of the ways that i do that uh jordan I love what you said about drag. <clears throat> um, I would love to put together kind of like a comprehensive theology of drag. That's one of the things I would super love to do and I'm kind of already working on. Um, my seminary professors have gotten their first drag papers ever, they've said, so doing something. Um, so along those lines, um, drag helped me realize that everyone performs gender and the notions that I held on to about what gender was and had to be. Uh, was toxic masculinity manifesting in someone who wasn't even raised as a male to like absorb that from the world but i watched everyone else performing that um so once i let that go um i got to just perform me um and i like a lot of bright colors and flowers and i always like to be dressed to the nines um i have to tone it down most days on my way out the door um and then kind of along that line of thinking as well, um, just speaking openly about my identity and to use West Coast language, taking up my space um, that everyone else gets to take up without questioning. Um, but because the space that I occupy tends to make people uncomfortable, um, I'm asked to minimize myself. And so just refusing to like be minimized and just staying kind of myself and me and being proud of that and um, standing my ground, I'm an eight. So I like to make a, you know, <laughs> make a statement about it. So that's kind of how I celebrate myself um, and my identity. And, you know, I hope that that encourages others to feel liberated to do the same too. Um, and Don, have you shared about this? Um, I, I think probably in similar ways to what people have said, you know, through my clothes and sometimes I like to to um, mix and match things that are considered more feminine with more, you know, masculine, like maybe I'll wear a, um, a sundress with a fedora or, you know, some stuff like that. And I've also learned to um, cut my own hair just so that I can cut it however short I want to cut it and not have to deal with anybody else's comments about it. Um, and, you know, experiment with it a little, a little bit. And um, so I like being able to do that. Yeah. Well, I am so profoundly grateful that you all stepped in. Um, you are the A-team, even if you stepped in at the last minute for the folks who stepped out. Um, really literally could talk to you all day so you're lucky i won't um, i just want to um, lift up the kind of joyful celebration of loving yourself that we have talked about today and i forgot to ask someone to close us in prayer so i'll just do it in the spirit of claiming my uh, saintness that i that i spoke about earlier um, i just invite you to be your fullest self in every atom that you have. 
God who has life and breath and mystical ways of churning within and around us. You have known formlessness. You have known creation that is orderly, and you have even known what it is like to carry flesh, to have scars, and to be transformed. Be with all of us in whatever ways our bodies are beloved by ourselves, beloved by those who are beloved by us, or named by others whom we wish would stop it. You tell us that nothing can ever separate us from your love. We hope that your voice will be palpable so that all who have been lied to and told that they're anything less than perfectly knit together or re-knit or unwound or knotted, whatever ways they find their flaps and folds being carried, that anyone who has been lied to will know that you believe they are truly fabulous, 100%, without question, without care for votes or seconds or how church bodies move. Thank you for loving us as we continue our church life together apart in these crazy times. Be with those in Minneapolis. Be with all who live in black bodies and who have fear and help all stay safe. Those whose safety is in their own control and those whose safety is in other hands. We need you and we demand justice. Amen. Amen. Thank you everyone. Uh, next week is June 5th. And so if you're the Netflix watching type, maybe check out Queer Eye. Uh, if you're not, or um, at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we'll be here. We'll be having conversations with some of our beloved folk who have Black congregations in the Lutheran Church. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Take care. Bye. Bye.